but my custody level just kept dropping because of my involvement with this group. And so here I am now about like, I think I had probably just turned 21 and now I'm in close custody in this high security unit. So and you can imagine my family through all this, right? Mm -hmm. Concerned, what's happening? Why are you getting shipped so much? Why are we having visits behind the glass? Yeah. You know, and me, I wasn't being very honest with them or myself at the time. And I was kind of painting a picture of, you know, that it was kind of the system against me. Yeah. And, you know, and at some point, like I had to get real with them because from close custody and, you know, even more uh, incidents happening with other with other groups um, and getting more disciplinary cases, getting my rights read to me. Eventually, um, the administration had a at the Auburn unit decided to place me in level three administrative segregation, which is the lowest level you can pretty much be other than being on death row. And um, life got pretty real for me at that time, you know, and just, you're just sitting in the cell with a Bible, a little bitty toothbrush and some tooth powder, and that's it. Well, my name is Jose Nicolas Flores. Um, I'm 42 years old. I just noticed you had a Savannah shirt on. Yeah, representative. <laughs> it was her birthday yesterday, I think. Um, yeah, I currently live in uh, Leander, Texas, which is uh, north, here, north here of Austin. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, like I represent myself in a lot of spaces where I go. I'm formerly incarcerated, um, spent almost 13 years incarcerated in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And then I'm also a person uh, with the lived experience of being in recovery from uh, substance use and uh, mental health challenges. And um, and now, I mean, uh, what I do for as far as employment, I'm a program specialist seven with the, the Health and Human Services here in Austin. And I work with this program called the Texas Target Open Response. So the team that I work with, we manage all the federal funding to address the opioid epidemic for Texas. Uh, okay, and program specialist, that's a yeah. title that I kind of recognize. Yeah, so my role within that program is a, I'm the recovery support services lead. Okay. So within TTOR, we have a treatment, prevention, integrated, and then uh, manage all the recovery support service uh, projects. Um, and so that... Go and you went, um, so when I met you mm -hmm. in New Orleans... Yeah, that's 2017 the, or 18, the, it was... It was the, um, Correctional Education Association, yes. the Vera Institute had us out there. Yes. What were you doing back then? <clears throat> back then, I was a substance use counselor managing an intensive outpatient substance use treatment program for youth in San Antonio, Texas. And I was I loved it. And um, my passion was always working with youth. I had just came from working at like a really nice, you know, private pay residential, like substance use treatment center, like in the hill country. But um, something was calling me back to like, you know, the city and the communities in San Antonio. Um, and yeah, I, uh, a former uh, colleague of mine, you know, told me about an opportunity to like manage that whole program. And I had done that before as an intern. And, you know, here I was now with some years under my belt of experience and working with different populations and you know, they pretty much just handed me the keys to this nonprofit, you know, uh, outpatient program. And I loved it and I managed it and, you know, and um, I pretty much did it on my own, you know, with the support of the director who was right across town at the residential for um, adolescent girls. But then I utilized some resources from uh, the local community college where I graduated from and had practicum students in and out helping me. And I was training them at the same time. So. You know, and when I met you, it was really my first um, like opportunity and like realizing there was like this whole community of people like us, yep. like formerly incarcerated folks that had found roles in like higher education, clinicians, um, they were practicing attorneys now. And, you know, and I can't even remember how I connected with Ter Terrell from, uh, from where he was working then with the Vera Institute. And like the formerly incarcerated college graduate network. And that's when I just started learning. Because when I got out of prison, Brandon, I was just really focused on continuing my college education and then getting into the substitute treatment field. Because I felt like that was going to be something that was going to benefit me and I was going to be able to be of service too. So now I'm learning. So that would have been August of 2018 is when mm -hmm. we went out there. Yeah. And <clears throat> how long have you been out? Uh, January, I celebrated 11 years. So... At that time, 
Uh-huh. I had been out 13 years. I've been out 19 years now. Oh, wow, congratulations, so, bro. I had been out 13 years, and I had never met anyone else who was uh, trying to be involved in education or anything back in the prisons mm-hmm. and was going through <coughs> the academic process, you know, bachelor's at master's. Yeah. I had met, you know, I had all my friends, like, while I was in prison, and I knew a bunch of ex-convicts, but I didn't know any that were pursuing education mm-hmm. and trying to go back in. So, 2017, I went to the National Conference for Higher Education in prison. In CHEP, yeah. In CHEP, and that was when I, like you, I was like, I met all these people. Mm-hmm. So, that was November of 2017. So, by the time I had met you, I had already been like, four conferences. And so I remember to know that, like, you didn't know anybody. I was, like, stoked. I was like, well, let me tell you about this. And yeah. this, and this no, and this I was this. overjoyed to meet you because you were from Texas, too. And, you know, and you were coming, you know, doing great things, you know, since you've been out. So, yeah, it was cool. And where are you actually from? <clears throat> I'm from a little town called Marble Falls, Texas, okay. which is about 45 minutes north of west of Austin. Okay. Yeah. So I'm originally from, I was born in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, my parents are both from uh, from Mexico and um, they met um, in 1980, the year I was born in Detroit, Michigan. They were both working in a, a part of Southwest Detroit in a part known as Mexican town. They were working like in the ser- in the service industry. And, um, and then after I was born, like around 1983, 1984, I believe my parents, uh, we moved to California, to Southern California. My parents were you know, working in the fields as migrant farm workers and, you know, and um, I still have vivid memories of uh, my mom dropping me and my little brother off um, with the lady that would take care of all the migrant farm workers' kids. And then they would walk off into the fields until they were like little bitty ants, you know. And um, to this day, I think my parents would say, and I know they told me it was like the hardest work they've ever done. Yeah. Getting paid cents, you know, to, uh, you know, fill as many crates as they could. But yeah, 1985, my uh, my dad um, had a brother, my uncle. Uh, my uncle Chewy was already here in Marble Falls, and um, he encouraged my dad to move us to Texas, you know, and he had some work lined up for him already. And yeah, we landed in this little small rural community of Marble Falls, Texas, of all places. And um, Did they do well, like, in terms of work when they um, got here? Or was it still hard labor? It was still hard labor. I mean, I can remember my parents working two, three jobs at a time. Um, both of my parents worked. Um, you know, uh, sometimes in our culture, it's not it's common to see, you know, the woman, the mother just taking care of the home. And my mother would do that and still work two jobs. So I grew up seeing my father, you know, working hard labor. My mother working like in lunch lines, housekeeping. I remember at one time they were both working at a, out of cleaners. They had picked up the skill of like ironing clothes a long time ago. Um, you know, and I always you know, admired and respected my uh, my parents' work ethic, right? Um, they did well. I mean, at one point they were able to purchase property in a house. It was a trailer home out in the hill country, but that's pretty much where me and my brother were raised, you know? Yeah. And, um, and early on, you know, I was really stuck to my dad and, um, and his hobbies and but at some point, like, I really got involved in sports. Like, sports was my outlet. Um, from playing baseball, football, soccer, basketball. I mean, I was all about it. Any any um, sport I could get involved in, I was in it. And in academics. Like, I excelled primary school, K through, uh, what, second grade, and then uh, um, elementary school, third through fifth. I was, I was doing pretty well. You know, like that really boosted my self-esteem, especially from a kid that his first language was Spanish. Um, but then like things changed for me in middle school, even in a small rural community, you know, there was still, um, you know, kids that got influenced by like street games that originated actually here of all places in Austin, Texas. Yeah, so this would have been late 80s? <clears throat> early, late early 90s. 80s. Early 90s, early 90s, yeah. So middle school, I probably was around like, it was around 1991 probably. 1991, probably 1992. You were born in 1980? 1980. When's your birthday? July 5th, 1980. Cancer. My birthday is August 6th, 1980. Cool. So, okay, so we went through the whole uh, educational process. So we had yeah. some 91 hours in sixth grade at a middle school in uh, Grand Prairie. Okay. Up in Arlington, Dallas. Grand Prairie is Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was the, the time, at least from my experience, that was when gangster rap and being in a gang was... That was just cool. Yeah. That was just everywhere. Yeah, I mean, yeah, hip-hop music, gangster rap was very influential around that time. 
So even in a small rural community with, you know, semi-metro area like Austin nearby, the influence of uh, the street gangs over here influenced that town as well. And that's what happened, man. At six, at, in sixth grade, you know, I was in, uh, in like these uh, advanced classes because I had done so well in elementary school. But then um, this uh, Hispanic gang in my community like started bullying me and uh, making fun of me and clowning me because I was, they, they called me schoolboy because I had all different types of friends because I was really involved in sports. You know, they, uh, you know, would question like how Mexican I was or how Hispanic I was. Yeah. Even though like in my home, I always spoke with Spanish. To this day, I only speak to my parents in Spanish, you know? Mm. And, um, and then I slowly started seeing how I was struggling in school too. Um, I wasn't as advanced as I, maybe I thought I was or as the school thought I was too. You know, here I was the only brown kid in, in a classroom full of Caucasian kids, you know, and it was kind of intimidating and I did my best, but like um, I struggled. And then with, uh, you know, the things that were happening in school with that particular group, eventually like all of the motivation I was putting into academics and sports, I turned it into joining this this gang and doing everything that you think comes with that, mm -hmm. right? Um, from substance use, you know, committing crimes, getting into fights with other members of other groups. Um, things weren't great at home. Um, my parents, you know, were dealing with some uh, issues themselves. And, you know, growing up in, in, in my culture, like we didn't necessarily talk about things that were going on in the house, right? Yeah. And so my outlet, which was sports, you know, kind of went away and, you know, it turned into hanging out with a group and doing the things that came with that lifestyle. And slowly but surely, you know, um, I started having, you know, uh, you know, problems at school, disciplinary things happening, getting sent to alternative school. Um, I was able to, you know, get out of middle school and transition on the high school, but, you know, I was always in and out of suspension, like in school suspension, alternative school. And by the time I got to a uh, high school freshman year, I had good intentions of like trying to straighten out. I remember I, uh, rather than, I went out for football my freshman year, but couldn't really take, uh, the uh, the verbal stuff coming from the coaches, you know, I had a problem yeah. with authority even then, <laughs> yeah. and um, and I decided to slide back and not continue with my friends playing football that I had played in middle school with, and and then I joined the, the soccer team and like made varsity my freshman year, and I was really happy about that, that boosted my self esteem. Right here I am, this kid, you know, now with you know some upperclassmen playing varsity soccer, and you know still being involved with that group. Um, and I broke my ankle like maybe three or four games into the season, and that kind of ruined my season. So now I had a lot of time on my hands, right? And um, and I want to say this was maybe the fall of 93 or 94. I'm not too sure on the dates. But um, the group that I was with got into an altercation with another group in the middle of the school hallway. And at that time, I had started carrying a butterfly knife, right? Thinking I was cool and I necessarily needed it for protection, right? Um, just getting caught up in this lifestyle. And so while we were, you know, in this altercation with this other group, the um, the knife fell out of my pocket, you know, and um, my teacher observed that it was mine, that it fell out of my pocket. And so here I am, 14 years old, getting arrested at school my freshman year and um, getting involved with the system. I uh, got arrested and I got uh, transferred to a little small juvenile facility in um, Hondo, Texas, probably right down the street from where Torres was at at that mm -hmm. time. And I just remember, you know, spending a week there, you know, like just kind of, you know, interacting with other kids that were, you know, had justice involvement and had pending cases. And it was a little co-ed facility. So they were like, actually girls, how's there with this too? And, you know, and we're sitting together, congregating, you know, learning about each, you know, where people are coming from, what led them to being locked up there. <clears throat> And then um, a week at, a week of being there, my parents picked me up. And um, I didn't really know what to expect. You know, I'm still a kid and I've never been involved with the system, any type of system. And um, um, I immediately learned, though. I mean, I ended up going to court. Um, I got sentenced to a year of juvenile probation. I got assigned a probation officer. And I got expelled from school for the rest of the school year. And so that immediate, the immediate thought that I had was that, you know, I'm going to be behind now. All the kids that I had grown up with from primary school up until freshman year, like, I'm going to be behind them. That was my first immediate thought. Yeah. 
you know, and I kind of like, <clears throat> they didn't feel good, you know, because we had grown up together. We're, well, we're going to graduate together. And so um, my dad, you know, being the man that he is, you know, told me, like, I'm, you're not just going to be hanging out at the house or on the street. You're going to go to work. Mm -hmm. And so we had a next door neighbor um, who uh, let me work with him. He was a contractor and, um, you know, I immediately started working construction, you know, and working with grown men you know, and learning the trade as much as I could and and reporting to my uh, probation officer and, you know, going to the little bit of services that they have, which really looked like support groups. And, um, but my involvement with the gang still continued. And, um, you know, we were, you know, vandalizing things, doing graffiti. And uh, at some point my PO told my parents that it would be best if they maybe relocated me out of Texas because she feared that I was going to end up revoking my probation and getting sent to TYC, you know, which, yeah. which was the old TJJD, the Texas Youth Commission. And so that's what my parents did around 19, late 94, or early 95. My uh, mom uh, sent me to live with my aunt and my uncles and my cousins in Detroit, Michigan, mm -hmm. back to the city where I was born. Right. And um you know, and I'm not going to lie, you know, I was a little, I was angry, I was upset, but a little bit of in me was also like kind of excited too to get away, you're right, because things weren't really going well. You know, I had slowly seen how things were kind of getting bad, and I definitely didn't want to go to TYC, and so, um, you know, I moved in with my aunt and my uncle and my cousins, and I was sharing the basement with uh, two of my cousins and another uncle of mine that was living with us, and, and I enrolled in school. Um, I met my probation officer and she, you know, she just wanted me to check in every Saturday and call an answering machine and leave a message saying I was okay. And then complete my community service at the local YMCA and don't get in any trouble. And it was simple as that. And, um, and I adapted, I uh, got me a little job as a busboy dishwasher at this little restaurant in the neighborhood. Um, started making friends, hanging out with my cousins meeting some of my family I hadn't, you know, seen in years. And things were going well, but, um, you know, before I moved to Detroit, I uh, had already started using certain substances here in Texas, like cannabis and alcohol. And living up there in Michigan, it kind of opened my eyes to all these other different substances that were around, you know, and I became curious and began trying different things like hallucinogenics and MDMA. Um, I always looked a lot older than I was, even at 14 and 15 years old. And so I was able like to purchase alcohol. And so, I mean, I know that I was dealing with some things cause I was, you know, thousands of miles away now from home. And while I was in Detroit, you know, my mom, um, had started the process of divorcing my dad as well. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that was in the back of my mind that, you know, things might be different when I come home. And so I did well in school. I ended up finishing that school year successfully. I finished probation successfully. And I wanted to stay up there and live and continue living with my family up there. But my uncle had become aware of my, uh, my substance use and some of the things I was involved with. And, you know, he didn't think I, he could be handle all that. So I came back home to like this whole new family dynamic, Brandon, right? like my mom, my little brother and me now. Yeah. You know, and um Marble Falls. And Marble same. Falls, yeah. And you know, so here I am, this kid coming back from living in the city now to, you know, living in this rural community again and um and rather than being supportive of my mother and helping her with my little brother, I feel like I had a lot of resentment towards her and my dad for how things have changed now and this split broken family and you know and Coming back, you know, off probation now, you know, I kind of, in my mind, I was thinking, well, I can, I'm free, you know, and so I continue using substance, substances. The gang lifestyle was kind of out the, kind of, I left behind and I was more about, you know, um, you know, using drugs, selling drugs, you know, to get the things that I needed and wanted. Um, and sure enough with that, eventually came with more, you know, involvement with the juvenile system. And I ended up getting placed on probation again when I was 16 for like a small theft, um, getting assigned the same probation officer. Um, academically, I wasn't doing really well in school. I was just kind of between um, sophomore and junior year. 
And um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just tough. Um, I didn't really know what to do with myself. My mom, my dad didn't know what to do with me. My school didn't know what to do with me. Juvenile probation didn't really know what to do with me. Did your dad stick around the Marble Falls area? Yeah, he's still there to this day, you know, so we would see him occasionally, right? You know, my dad would come to pick up me and my little brother, but you know, I really don't have any memories of us spending time, a lot of time together during that time. And um, I mean, I eventually finished um, juvenile probation and I can still remember to this day my my probation officer, John Von Dolan, telling me like, you know, Jose, you know, at 17, you're not going to be considered, you know, a juvenile anymore. You can go to jail and prison as an adult at that age. And um, I mean, I had already heard those things before and that really, and it clicked, but, you know, as a kid, you're just, you know, all I was wanting to do that day was just sign my signature on my discharge papers and be done. And not even probably a few months after I turned 17, I picked up my first felony as an adult and of all places, Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. I had stolen a car um, out there in that rural community and uh, me and a couple of friends of mine uh, drove it to Houston to visit some friends with the intention of selling the car. And while we were in the north side of Houston, three ball brown kids, you know, uh, looked suspicious and APD mm -hmm. rolled right behind us in the you know, in the Mercedes Benz that we had stolen. And um, one of the guys that was with me was, you know, underage, he was, he was like 16 and I was 17. And so I got sent to downtown to the Harris County Jail in 1997. Mm -hmm. And um, and I just remember being scared, you know, like this big old beast of a building and, you know, being placed in a tank with a bunch of grown men. And I just remember, you know, uh, uh, some of the Hispanic guys and they're kind of taking me under their wing and, um, you know, telling me like, don't talk to them. Don't sit over here. Yep. Shower over here. Don't talk to the guards. Bring no attention to yourself. Um, so after about a week and being in Harris County jail, uh, my mother and my then um, girlfriend came to pick me up in Houston and I and bonded me out of jail. And so, you know, here I am coming back to, to Marble Falls, Texas now with, you know, a pending, you know, charge in Harris County. And, um, and I was still going to school at the time, but not as much. And um, I eventually dropped out and um, something significant, you know, has stuck with me um, from my, from the, the time that I was last in high school. Um, I remember just walking into school one morning, you know, and um, probably under the influence because I was always under the influence of cannabis. And I just remember this teacher, um, Hispanic teacher at that who worked in like the ESL classes, you know, uh, stopped me when I was entering the school and just looked at me with like this utter look of disgust in her face and just said, you're still here. And to this day, like that has stuck with me, you know, and I kind of, I don't feel she was justified in telling the kid that, but I can kind of understand where she was coming from that I really wasn't taking it serious, you know, but to this day, you know, that, I think that was the motivation for a lot of the things I've accomplished now in my life. Um, luckily, um, you know, there was a local judge, Judge Peggy Simon, in that town who um, wasn't just going to let me drop out of school. Um, and she uh, told me, you're going to get your GED at least. And I did that, Brennan. Like, uh, she enrolled me in these the GED classes in the evening at the same high school where I was going, you know, mostly all adults. And you got my GED. Like the first time that they did the, the test, I remember finishing that thing quick and being the first person to walk out of there, you know, and passing it, you know. Um, so, you know, I had this pending charge in, um, in Harris County, you know, and I just got my GD and me and my mom were having to travel back and forth to Houston for my court dates and that was tough. And then I was joining the workforce to um, finding little jobs like in the service industry or like general labor. But the one thing I always gravitated to was like, you know, selling drugs, you know, not only to get money, but also to support my addiction. I knew that at, by that time, you know, I was using daily, if it was an alcohol, cannabis, or even other substances like um, other stimulants. And um, I remember one day, I didn't have my, my driver's license at the time. Um, so my mom was the one driving us to my court dates in Houston. And 
I remember my mother had worked really late one night, so we had to wake up really early the next morning to be able to make it to to the courtroom in downtown Houston. And I remember my mom telling me like, you know, Miko, we gotta pull over because I'm fixing to fall asleep. And I said, well, let's pull over. So we stopped at a gas station and, and slept for a little bit. By the time we woke up, we realized we were probably gonna be late. And so when we got to the courtroom, I just remember the bailiff uh, putting the handcuffs on me and putting me in the box because I was late to court. And I pretty much got pressured into either going back to jail and bonding out again, or taking the three years probation they were offering me that day. Yeah. And so in my mind, there was an easy option, right? I don't want to go back inside of jail. You know, I already knew what that was like, but it, you know, and at that time, I mean, it was pretty violent in the Harris County jail. And so I signed for three years probation. Still had to come back to Harris County one more time to report to probation. And so they eventually transferred it down to the county where I was living. But even then, even with being on adult probation now, I was still involved, you know, in substance use and selling drugs. And eventually all that caught up with me. Um, I ended up picking up a burglary charge, three delivery of like different narcotics. And it was pretty inevitable now that I was probably going to end up going to the Texas Department of yeah. Criminal Justice because it's was not it like one of those deferred adjudication probations or it was it was out of Houston and so here I am now with four pending charges in Bernie County you know and I know I'm gonna get revoked in Harris County as well but right now I'm more focused on the charges I got in Bernie County and um, and I had an attorney who was kind of you know postponing my court dates you know and that was helpful but it was just giving me more time to kind of make things worse for myself and so eventually you know um I remember, I think it was fall of uh, 1998. I went to court with my with my dad, and um, they called me up, you know, to speak to the judge, and they revoked my bond because of a uh, revocation that had came out of Harris County, and and I went in to the county jail, you know, and plea bargained for five years TDCJ, um, which could have been actually eight years probation and boot camp and some type of substance use treatment. But in my head at 18 years old, I was like, I can't do eight years probation. Couldn't even do three years. You know, I just didn't feel like I was in the right state of mind to be able to do that successfully. And so I kind of listened to some of the older heads in the county jail, you know, and they just kind of, well, you gotta be real with yourself. And so I signed for five years, TDCJ, so here I am. Yeah. Were you under the impression that you would only do like a year or two? Yeah, I was. And that was actually my plan. And I went down to TDCJ. I caught chain, ended up at the holiday unit in 99 in Huntsville. And, you know, this was before Priya, right? This was when the gangs were pretty active in general yeah. population. And, you know, I slowly started seeing as young guys like me, young brown guys like me were joining different groups. And I eventually gravitated towards a group as well. And more out of fear, protection, but also being this young kid who had a lot of anger and resentment inside of him and, um, you know, and joining this group, you know, um, I really was kind of naive to what it was really going to look like in there. Mm -hmm. And so I joined this group and eventually I caught chain from uh, from the holiday unit. And I got sent to this really small uh, unit in Dybal, Texas. The facility used to be like an old juvenile facility. It was air conditioned, right? This was in 99. And so... The group that I was involved with, there was members there as well. And so, you know, we instantly, you know, got together and met one another and, you know, and I had good intentions. I remember at that certain facility, they only offered like GED and they had like a boat, uh, they had a construction carpentry class. And so I joined that. I remember we were building the house from bottom, from the bottom to the top for Habitat for Humanity. But um, the first um, incident that happened with another group, you know, or um, I ended up assaulting uh, some folks. Uh, I got placed in a, in a, in transit status, right? And now I have a disciplinary case. And I remember just sitting now here in this small cell by myself, like solitary confinement, you know, waiting to find out, you know, what my, uh, that my consequences were going to be and then where I was going to get shipped because according to the administration, I wasn't going to stay there. Yeah. 
And so that's exactly what happened. Um, I ended up going to the burn unit, and from there they shipped me to a medium, a minimum medium security facility in La Mesa, Texas, which was the Smith unit. And um, same thing, the group that I was involved with was still active in general population, and so here we are now at the Smith unit. And um, I ended up catching chain though one day. Guess who came to pick me up? Harris County on a bench warrant. Mm -hmm. And unexpectedly, right, one day I'm being told you're catching chain. And so and you got the, the five years for the four pending charges and this yes. was like something you didn't even know about? This was the, the probation that I had revoked out of Harris yeah. County for that unauthorized use of a vehicle. And so here I am now catching chain, you know, from the Smith unit to Harris County and and back then they would put like, you know, 17 to 21 year olds in like what they were called like the youngster tanks, right? Yeah. And uh, I remember being housed in one of those youngster tanks. This was around 2000 probably. And, um, you know, and it was just a horrible experience. If we weren't fighting with one another, the guards were coming in and stripping us down, tearing up our stuff you know, making us sit at the tables with our hands, like our heads on the table and our hands behind our back, like just pretty much harassing us and manipulating us just because they wanted to. Yeah. And um, I was so happy to get out of there to get time served and then eventually catch Shane back to TDCJ. And um, this time I ended up getting sent to the Garza's in Beeville. And at that time, the particular group that I was with was at war with another group. And so the first time that we saw each other on those big long bowling, you know, bowling yep. alleys at the transfer facilities. You know, we uh, got into a fight and um, more disciplinary cases, right? And uh, eventually, they housed my the group I was with on one on the guards of West and the other group on guards of East. And so here we are in this. We have this whole like dorm to ourselves, and little by little, TDCJ is shipping us now all over the state. And by that time, I'm my I'm I'm close custody now. And I get sent to uh, the R Red unit, which is in uh, Iowa Park, Texas, near Wichita Falls. And they had just recently opened up those high security units, those brand new ones. They had you all over. All they over. All the way up there, all the way down. All down here. So, you know, like I said, I had good intentions of trying to make parole yeah. pretty quickly on this nonviolent five year sentence. But my custody level just kept dropping because of my involvement with this group. And so here I am now, about like, I think I had probably just turned 21 and now I'm in close custody in this high security unit in Iowa Park, Texas. And you can imagine my family through all this, right? Mm -hmm. Concerned, what's happening? Why are you getting shipped so much? Why are we having visits behind the glass? Yeah. You know, and me, I wasn't being very honest with them or myself at the time. And I was kind of painting a picture of, you know, that it was kind of the system against me. Yeah. And, you know, and at some point, like I had to get real with them because from close custody, and you know, even more uh, incidents happening with other with other groups, um, and getting more disciplinary cases, getting my rights read to me, um, like that was scary. And then eventually, um, the administration at a at the Auburn unit decided to place me in level three administrative segregation, which is the lowest level you can pretty much be, other than being on death row. And um, life got pretty real for me at that time, you know, and just, you're just sitting in the cell with a Bible, a little bitty toothbrush and some tooth powder, and that's it. And I was able to work my way up to late level one SAG where I had a little bit more, uh, you know, privileges. But at some point, the gang intelligence found enough evidence to confirm me as a security threat group member. So I know what that meant. I knew that I was stuck in SAG and I wasn't going to make parole. and. I'm going to discharge this whole five year sentence. And, um, and I remember leaving November of 2003, you know, discharging my whole sentence day for day and getting to the walls unit in Huntsville, you know, so happy, you know, cause I'm going to see my family again after being incarcerated in this little baby Alcatraz. Yeah. Look coming out translucent cause I haven't <laughs> got son in like a couple years. And um, I remember getting to the walls unit and they didn't want to let me go because it was still showing that I had an active bench warrant out of Harris County for the charge I had already got done with. Yeah. And so luckily my mom was able to make some calls to the attorney she had hired for me and um, they were able to get that cleared. And I walked out of the walls unit free after five years of being incarcerated. And like I said, good intentions again, Brennan. I moved to San Antonio, Texas, where my mom and my little brother had relocated. 
And uh, my mom at the time was going to school to become a substance use counselor um, at the same college where I eventually graduated from. My little brother was actually in a, at a, going to school at a university as well in San Antonio. And so here I come now, about 23 years old now, to kind of start my life over. But the same way I was involved with that group on the inside, the expectation was to still be involved when I got yeah. out. And that's exactly what I did. I reported to that group and I got out. And, you know, I had, I knew that like, that academics has always been something that I could do well with, right? And I actually um, uh, went to the local community college, San Antonio College and registered and I had a plan to major in print graphic design. I had this idea of like one day starting my own clothing line having my own characters, opening my own print shop. Um, but like this lifestyle that I still had to be a part of and being a college student just didn't mix. And yeah, now you had to be a part of that. Now I had to be a part of it. So slowly but surely, you know, you know, I think I only went to school for about a week before I dropped out. And then same thing, all, here we are again now, right? Almost 10 years later from when I was 13 years old and putting academics and sports to the side for this lifestyle. Here I am now, 23, doing the same thing. And my substance use increased. I had access to a lot more drugs. You know, um, I had to carry a weapon at the time because we were still actively, you know, at war with another group at that time. And life was kind of scary, but it was very fast. And before you know it, um, I got addicted to to benzodiazepine, Xanax, and anxiety medication that made me feel like I was Superman. And here I was robbing other drug dealers here in Austin, committing robberies, and, you know, and eventually I got arrested for aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon. Six months after I had discharged a five-year sentence. And so I'm sitting in the Travis County Jail here in Austin now facing 30 years for aggravated robbery with a deadly weapon. And they hit me with a hot bitchel, 15 to 99, and you know, and I finally was realizing that, you know, my way of living, I always say this, my way of living just wasn't working. Yeah. You know, my involvement with this group wasn't working. Um, I was hurting myself. I was hurting my family. I was hurting other people in the community. Something had to change. Something had to give. And one of the best decisions I ever made was to disassociate from the group that I was in. And a lot of people ask me questions about, like, well, how were you able to do that? And I always provide the explanation that, the as far as long as I was in the process, I wasn't there to where I was considered a full member yet, yeah. where I would have serious repercussions for yeah. sliding back. And so I was able to do that, you know, with no strings attached, thank God. And um and then I started believing in something greater than myself, you know, because I realized that my will just was leading me down some really dark, ugly places. And you know, and I started uh, you know, really you know, believing in this higher power, this thing called God and going to a prayer circle and just trying to just have this like, this huge like personality change, right? And um, and I remember not even know how, knowing how to pray, Brandon. And I remember this old school cat in, uh, in the county jail just uh, encouraged me to pray for something that I can handle, right? As far as, you know, my sentence. And that's exactly what I would pray for. And I would pray for my family to bless them and protect them. and. After six months, um, you know, Judge Kasurik in the, I think it was the 290th court, had mercy on me and gave me 12 years, you know, and I felt that was a number I could handle. But, you know, I knew that as soon as I got back to TDCJ, I was going straight to solitary confinement because mm -hmm. I was still, yeah. I might not be active with the group anymore, but, but TDCJ that. doesn't know that. And at that time, you know, the process to get out of, you know, solitary confinement at SEG to get to the grad program was a little bit longer. And I remember um, I got shipped to the holiday unit again, and I spent nine, min uh, nine months in their building where they housed all the confirmed uh, security threat group members. And then, um, and then I got shipped to the Conley unit in Kennedy, Texas, which was the closest I'd ever been to my family at the time. You know, and um, I was happy about that, but also knowing I was probably spend some more years and in solitary confinement. And I did, um, I spent five more years before the administration, the gang intelligence, saw that I was sincere about uh, disassociating from the gang. And and then I got shipped to the Ramsey One unit in, um, in Real Sharon. And that was really just a shock, right? From one day being in a cell by yourself, 23 hours a day, 
to now being in a classroom environment in this cognitive intervention class with this little old lady, Miss Kathy Gant, you know, mm -hmm. being our instructor. But to this day, I think that's where my healing process started. It was when Miss Gant slapped a journal on our desk the first day of class and said, I'm gonna give y'all topics every day before the end of class. And the next day, you know, I want you to bring back what you've written. And we were like, cool, right? You know, we can do that. And then I remember getting to class the next day and Miss Kathy Gant had a podium at the front of the, <laughs> the, front of the class. And the expectation was for us to come share the things that we had written about on the topics she had given us. So you can imagine these 16 guys in my group who come from all the different security threat groups that have been incarcerated <laughs> 20, 30 years and yeah. have life sentences that have done some work, you know, for the groups they used to be in. I'm talking about old gangsters being like adamant that they're not going to go to that podium and share, <laughs> share their thoughts and feelings about what they've written. But slowly but surely we did because it was part of the class and it was a requirement and we knew that we had worked really hard to get to this program to get out of solitary confinement. And during those nine months, you just saw transformations. You know, you saw people sharing trauma, things they had gone through before incarceration, during incarceration, things that they were concerned about still, because, you know, we have loved ones out there. And, uh, you know, before you knew, you had people just literally bawling, you know, sharing things that they had never shared before because they, because Miss Kathy Gant gave us that space to do that. And she was one of the first people that really showed me that there was genuine people out there that just cared, that there was no other ulterior motive to work with guys like us, but other than just to, because God had put it on her heart to do so. She yeah. worked for Wyndham for like, I think at that time, maybe 20 years. She could have worked anywhere she wanted, but she decided to work in the prison system. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, out of that group of 16, Brandon, by the time we graduated nine months later, there was only about eight of us. You know, some guys, when they got back to general population, started getting tattoos, using substances, establishing relationships with officers, started getting into fights, you know, and, you know, it was sad, you know, because some of these guys that were in my group, were actually guys that used to be in the group, we used to be in together, guys I had done time with at other units, I'd been in SEG with, and, and there they were headed back to that box. But I was driven, man. I was motivated to do something. I was going to take advantage of this opportunity. I wasn't even necessarily thinking about parole, Brandon. I knew that completing grad and getting out of solitary confinement was going to possibly increase my chances. But I was more about getting prepared, brother. Like that had, so that's all I had been doing those five years in say reading, writing, yeah, just keeping my mind busy. And um, I was I was trying to stay at the Ramsey One Unit after I completed grad, um, so I could start. Uh, my college education there with the Clear Lake. And um, unfortunately, um, I got shipped. Um, Ms. Kathy Gann was trying to advocate for me to be like her helper for that cognitive intervention class, but they ended up shipping me to the, the Stevenson unit in Quero, Texas. But when I got there, you know, this is like a minimum security facility. There's a lot of ex gang members there. They offered, they had a college education program there being run from through a coastal Bend college in Beeville. And so I immediately, you know, signed up, right? Because that was my intention. I wanted to start my college education because I'm going home one day. Yeah. I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I knew that I wanted to start doing things that were working for me before, even for when I was a kid and that was school. And um, so I, I signed up for a couple classes. I remember I was taking speech and um, like a remedial math class because I was so behind the math and, um, and loving it. And I remember I wasn't just involved uh, with Coastal Band. I was also... Um, in this electrical, like, uh, vocational trade. Yeah. And um, so I was, you know, if you saw me at that unit, you know, I always had a textbook in my hand. I'm always going from the vocational trade to the schoolhouse or I'm on the rec yard. Like, I was really just trying to stay off the pod, the block, right, where the negativity is at, where it's loud, where the gambling, you know, where a lot of the things are that I'm not trying to be involved in like I used to be when I was in that lifestyle. And, um, and... Eventually, I made parole. I remember I, I came up for parole um, uh, six years into my 12-year uh, sentence and got denied. And then the following year, I got my FI-5. And, um, you know, I'm getting contact visits again, seeing my mom, my siblings. And, you know, we're, you know, I feel like going through our healing process as well because there's still a lot of trust issues and resentment there. 
for the things that I had uh, done. And um, I remember uh, the unit parole officer had told me, you know, that, you know, you can stay here and complete, you know, your vocational trade or you can get signed up right now to get shipped as soon as possible to that fi5 program so the in prison therapeutic community yeah. and as much as i wanted to complete that trade you know i wanted to go home yeah and so i immediately got placed on the list to get to that uh, facility as soon as possible and i did uh, i think it was summer of 2011 i got shipped to the cow unit in Cal, texas which is right down the street here yeah and it's the closest i've ever been to home so you can imagine how happy i am i'm six months from going home my family's able to come visit me more regularly and um and i get to this therapeutic community program which we always refer to as the snitch program right this is where you had to like drop tickets drop tickets right and so <laughs> and so this was a big shock now to come from you know thousand man facilities now to this little bitty like maybe 600 man unit and um you know i remember getting to the block you know and some guys coming up to me because they assign you what was known as a big brother right and he's kind of lacing you up on like how the unit runs what the programming's like you know, and, and we're, we're talking amongst each other, how we're going to write tickets on each other, bring each other to accountability circle, get through this our six months and go home. And I said, cool. And so, um, you know, we're going to the accountability circle, faking it till you make it. But then I quickly learned that there were some guys that were really into programming and were going to drop tickets on you because they wanted to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I remember going to the circle some days, just like really in my feelings. Right. Really hating that this guy is bringing me to the circle. And in my head, I'm thinking he's snitching on me. He's trying he's trying to, you know, get over on me. And but something happened, Brendan, like I started realizing what this program was really all about. Right. They were trying to help me to hold myself accountable for these behaviors right now while I'm incarcerated. So that when I get out, I'm not getting myself into a wreck and ended up going back to prison. And I started working in the in the counselor's office. I forgot what the name of it was, but I was a clerk, you know, and I had never had jobs like that. Right. Working in office spaces, even in TDCJ, because I was always, in, you know, in the fields. Yeah. And so um, it was really cool to be in the counselor's office and um, associate with them and hear their stories of like what led up to them becoming licensed chemical dependency counselors and working in the prison system. And then I had my mom, you know, out in the world going to school too to become a drug counselor. And then it just kind of clicked in my head, like, you know what, this might be a career that I could make a living out of, but then also help myself in my own recovery. And so after six months, I completed that program and paroled to uh, San Antonio, Texas to live with my mom and my little brother. And um, I was on the intense supervision for a year. I had the GPS ankle monitor back then when you started to carry that big old box to mm -hmm. along with your ankle monitor and had a long list of requirements from aftercare, support groups, obviously employment, paying all the fees, clean urine, drug test. And, um, and I was complying with everything. Yeah, I was about to say that was hard that was hard and i slowly start, you know because i had to be at the parole office pretty much weekly right and at that time my license was suspended and so i was having to utilize you know public transportation a lot and i learned the bus system pretty quickly and you know and i'm walking to some places but you know i immediately um set an appointment to visit with a gentleman named dr edward bergen in san antonio college um dr bergen at the time was like the director for that lcdc program and um, I remember the summer of 2012. I got out January 6, 2012. I think it was like the summer of 2012. I went up to meet with Dr. Bergen at school. And um, I pretty much told him everything about myself, why I wanted to become an LCDC. And um, I remember him pulling out a degree plan and telling me, Jose, take these classes this semester, this semester, all the way through. And he said, and if you do that, you're going to graduate with your associates in addiction counseling. You're going to become an LCDC. And I did that. I followed his guidance. I took all those classes. The semester he told me to take those classes, I did it. Yeah. And it was intimidating, you know, starting community college at 31 years old with kids coming straight out of high school yeah. with an ankle monitor on. And it's hot some days, bro. So I had the <laughs> words. You know, so, you know, obviously I'm getting some looks, but, you know, I surprised myself, you know, and I excelled and I ended up graduating as a distinguished graduate of that program. I mean, my name's on the plaque outside his office. And um, I won all these scholarships and, 
you know, and before I even graduated, I had my intern license and I'm working with adolescents in downtown San Antonio. They're all on juvenile probation. And, and then my career just started taking off because I'm bilingual. I have this great lived experience that at the time I feel like isn't really an asset. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm feeling like it's me just checking a box. Yeah. But then not even six months into my first job as a counselor intern, I get offered a job at this really nice residential treatment center called Starlight Recovery Center in Center Point, Texas, out in the hill country. You know, those really nice treatment centers that have pools, <laughs> you know, and gyms and nice cafeterias, along with all the programming they got, medical staff, and, you know, and here I am on parole still with my intern license, and now I'm working here at this program and commuting from San Antonio out to the hill country every day. And I loved it. And I said, man, God is good, because who would have thought? You know, that from being in a cell by myself, now I've got my own office at this treatment center. And I'm working with all different types of people from all different walks of life. You know, and, but I quickly learned that a lot of the things that I had experienced before incarceration and during incarceration had really impacted my mental health. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of untreated things that I realized from guidance of some of the clinicians I was wor working with that I probably needed to go see a professional. I and imagine. I did, and I did so, you know, for the first time in my life, I have, you know, insurance, medical insurance. And so I started uh, going to therapy, to individual therapy myself, because counselors need counselors. So I participated in some like really intense trauma therapy. It was called um, EMDR, which is eye movement desynthesization reprocessing. And I won't get into explaining it because I won't do a good job. I don't know if I've heard that from you. But I have heard that before. Yeah, I've so heard I, I heard about it through a professor of mine at school who went through some traumatic things and just spoke really highly of it. So when I had the opportunity to finally, you know, start working with a therapist, I specifically was looking for a therapist trained in that, not really even knowing what it was going to look like. Yeah. But I quickly learned, and I've actually gone through it a couple of times with two different therapists, and it was really helpful. And then, I mean, I've, you know, done just your typical, like, just talk therapy, not even when things are maybe stressful or bad, but just having an outlet to be able to process little things, even if it's just stressful things from that week. But um, I mean, that's not something that, you know, I was taught to do when I was younger. Um, I think being getting into the field that I did was a blessing in disguise to also help myself, right? Because I mean, learning about psychology and different um, counseling techniques and, you know, uh, pharmacology of addiction and then, what uh, the physiological and psychological symptoms of, you know, trauma and certain mental health disorders. It just, it st I started reading about things that sounded like about me, like that's me. And then I learned ways to address it because I'm providing this service for other folks, right? And um, I think that was one of the most impactful things. And to this day, I mean, I still utilize mental health services. If it's a support group that I find online, if it's, you know, uh, you know, seeing a, a therapist, um, you know, just different resources that I've learned how to access to help myself, you know, where at one time it looked like, you know, peer support groups at the parole office or intensive outpatient aftercare as a parole requirement or a 12-step fellowship going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings or Narcotic, Narcotics Anonymous meetings. Like I found like all these different approach, approaches to like help myself because things come up. Yeah. You know, like trauma is real, you know, little things you might hear, see, um, things that just come up at any time. Like I've learned ways to how to address them. And I know definitely the, what I don't do is just keep it inside. If it's just talking to another individual about it, a friend, a family member, a professional, et cetera. But, well, that's um, important. Like I mentioned to you earlier. Um, so five years ago, I had a panic attack. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what was happening and I, I didn't know what I was going through. And when I went to the doctor the next day, he was like, Oh yeah, you had a panic attack. <clears throat> and then it happened again. And it was one of those things, you know, and he gave me some lorazepam or whatever. Mm -hmm. But bef previous to that, I had the mindset, like I didn't understand why people who talk about this, I just saw them as weak or like they just I get it. They have the wrong mindset. They're just not in control. They're just letting their emotions take over. You just need to go through some. You just need to like, I don't know, get a grip. Mm -hmm. So when it happened to me and I didn't know why it was happening, I don't know what like set it off, you know. 
uh, then I started to appreciate like, okay, I guess people like they're saying something legitimate. They've got some real issues that they're dealing with and somehow their body reacts to it. So mm -hmm. I respect it more now just in the last five years, but I include that in the, in the stories in the prisons because I don't it, like you said, it's like, we don't want to be seen as having a problem going to the, the shrink or the psych mm -hmm. uh, or anything like that. And so we won't see them uh, and we don't want to talk about it for the same yeah. reasons. Yeah. And I think, you know, before, you know, especially in my culture, like we didn't want to talk about those things, right? You just suck it up or we would address it with other unhealthy behaviors. But now it like empowers me. It empowers me because I don't look at it as a weakness. I look at it as like I'm a man, you know, that has learned how to manage his mental health challenges by utilizing the resources that I was told to never access because, you know, you don't want to talk about those things with someone that could possibly report you or get right. you locked up or, you know, and I've just learned the complete opposite. I mean, I've had people the same way that I access services, people have come to me for this service, you know, yeah. and and I want to be there for them the same way that other people are there for me. Um, but I mean, that's probably been so huge in just my whole re-entry and all the years that I've been able to stay out of prison is knowing and being aware of like when things are coming up, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but that was, you know, I really started doing that around 2017, 2018. And um, and then life just took like a like a complete like turn for me where I thought like my darkest days were behind me when I was incarcerated. Like going through a breakup with a woman that I had been with for seven years was probably one of the most impactful things that has happened to me as far as like where it took me to a place where I didn't want to be. Mm. Because I came from a broken family and so I really was priding myself on making sure that this little family that I had, you know, put together, you know, um, would always be together. And now it was ending and so it was almost felt like I had failed and I needed to start over. And all the supports and all the things that I knew would help me to get out of that place, like I wasn't allowing myself to, right? I wanted to kind of like sit in that, mm. what I just like to refer as misery. But slowly but surely, like I did push myself out of it because I realized that I had a lot of responsibilities. People were counting on me and I wasn't going to give up, right? Because I had gone through a lot. Of, I mean, we've all both gone through some, you know, hard times in life and you know, luckily people reached out to me and, you know, I think a lot of it had to do with um, the work that I was doing, um, which when, when I started working in policy with the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition, I started realizing there was such a bigger community of folks like us out in the world, especially here in Texas, than just, than just the substance use treatment field that I had pretty much locked into, right? Um, and that's when I met you in New Orleans and I met folks from Vera, and then all the folks that were doing all this uh, work here in, um, in Austin. And that's when my life really changed because it, it energized me, right? It energized me for I was so heartbroken from this, this breakup and all the accomplishments I had up until that point didn't even matter. But now I was energized to like do this work, this policy work and help people like us, you know, that are still incarcerated or that are transitioning out to the community. And, and then like just doors started opening you know, um, to now being, you know, with the health and human services here in Austin and with the Texas target Oprah response, like who would have thought, right? Yeah. That a former prison gang member who spent eight years in solitary confinement, you know, would now be an employee for the state of Texas. And I'm, and I'm so grateful for it, but also, um, I realize that it comes with a lot of responsibility, right? And this is a conversation that I had with Reggie, you know, where, you know, like if we mess mess it up, we could possibly be messing it up for the next person that might yeah. fill our shoes. There might be one day a professor. Yeah. You know, with some of the same you know, same colleges you teach in or another employee that one day has has is qualified, right? And has similar experience as me or even more experience and is way more qualified because of maybe mistakes I made, they might not be willing to yeah. to hire them, right? So um, you know, everything that I've gone through, everything that I've experienced um, you know, I wouldn't change it. You know, I know we get those questions all the time. Like, what would you, what would you wish would have been different? Yeah. Like I've learned to accept it, you know, 
the cards that I was dealt in life are just that, and I played them, and I'm going to continue to play them, and you know, and I don't know where life's going to take me. You know, you know, I believe in a higher power greater than myself, and I know that at any point that my life trajectory might change. You know, where I might be a pastor at a church tomorrow. Yeah. You know, or I might join the tech field or, you know, but I always know that whatever I'm going to be involved with, I'm going to always make sure that I'm not causing any harm to folks either with my words or my actions and that I want to bring hope to to just people that may be struggling with whatever they're struggling, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, you answered the next question I was going to ask, which is what do, you, what do you think the future holds? What are some of your plans? Um, I mean... I want to travel a lot. I know that the world is so much bigger than just Texas and even the United States and even Mexico that I visited so much when I was a kid. And I want to see the world. I want to see the things that I've read about in books that I've seen in magazines that I've seen on TV, you know, all the historical things that have been around for like thousands of years. I'd love to be able to visit those places and Me experience <laughs> the, the environment or the things that I see people feel, you know, whenever they visit those places, right? Because there's so much history in our world, um, and uh, and just prepare myself too. I'm 42 years old now. I'll be 43 in July, and so I'm thinking ahead to my 50s too. I mean, I mean, I enjoy, I'm enjoying the present, you know. But I know that you know, if I make it to my 50s, I would like to be able to not work as hard, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm hopeful that one day I'll meet a younger version of myself, maybe two or three of those uh, people, <laughs> and. Um, you know, that they'll be able to carry on some of the work that uh, that I've created and I've done. Because, I mean, one thing that I did a lot and said I had no choice but was to think a lot. Yeah. You know, and every morning that I would wake up and I'd look in the mirror, you know, and I'd take a hard look at myself. And, and I remember thinking one day, like, what would my legacy be right now? When I learned what that word even was, probably from reading a novel or something, right? And just thinking, like, man, if I would... To leave this earth today, like what I'd be remembered for. And at that time, when I started thinking those thoughts, I said, I probably wouldn't be remembered for many yeah. great things. And I would like to think now that, you know, if I were to leave tomorrow, that, you know, people would maybe be inspired or have hope that they, that change is possible, you know? When we do the re entry, I asked them to um, just start with that. Mm -hmm. I read it in another reentry guide. They used that word legacy, mm -hmm. and uh, I was in a one of the jobs I had when I first got out was in some kind of meeting. It was like a professional development kind of meeting, and they asked, uh, "What do you want on your tombstone?" Which is like really morbid. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the guy sitting next to me, my boss, he's I'm gonna say he's like from Colombia or something. When it got to him, he said, um, what he wanted on his tombstone was he loved me. And the way he meant it was that everyone who would be at his funeral could have said that, that he who died loved him. He wanted to be known for having loved others. That's amazing. And I had to follow that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but I always remembered him saying that. And I was like, that's what he wanted to be remembered for. Like whoever remembered him knew that he loved him. So when I do the reentry, I ask him like, what do you want to be remembered for? And then whenever you kind of envision that, then work backwards to the present. What do you need to be doing today to fulfill that? That's good. That's an awesome exercise. It definitely makes you think. And a lot of folks like they hadn't thought of that. They just live day to day. I know. That's that's one thing I like, I mean, just now, I mean, being on a call and hearing some of the questions that I would hear from this individual. And, you know, like I like to make people think, and sometimes I don't even know where the questions come from. Maybe it's questions that I think maybe I would have wanted someone to ask me and now I'm asking others and it makes me really think, you know, but um, yeah, sometimes we just haven't had the pe people ask us. Like, yeah. Like the type of questions that will pull out the things that like, that we will learn more about ourselves. Yeah. You know, if that makes sense. Yeah. The the way that I do critical thinking is based on a book called Asking the Right Questions. Huh. <laughs> it's just kind of little tips and techniques about what kind of questions you ought to be asking about important issues in life. Yeah. And that's needed, especially for folks like us, folks that are coming out of incarceration that have maybe never had those questions asked. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you were going to talk to uh, some folks that are just starting their time 
you know, maybe some youngins with big time or just somebody, what is some advice you would give them about how they ought to do their time versus who knows what they heard about prison and what they should be acting like? How, how, what are some good things they, they should be doing with their time? To definitely access whatever programming might be available to them, regardless if it's not necessarily going to be what's going to be their life trajectory or career when they get out, but to at least have a start in whatever it might be. Like me starting off in the construction carpentry class, right? I took the same class. <laughs> yeah, or the electrical vocational trade, right? You know, but just having that routine, having that, having the different environment escape outside of the cell, the pod, the block, yeah. the rec yard, right? Was very helpful for me, right? And I've seen it be so much helpful for others as well. But not only that, but also like really studying and and um, like those critical thinking skills that you're talking about, right? Those aren't necessarily things that I was focused on, you know, like, cause those, those things take like a root, like. I, I think lead to like a really big personality change in a person Yeah. where you really start thinking things through in life, the things that matter, the things that you have to avoid, the things that you should get involved in, you know, after incarceration that are going to be beneficial to you and positive and healthy. Right. And I've actually learned a lot of those things along the way the past 11 years. Yeah. And I've had some really amazing experiences, but then I've also had some hard experiences as well. Where I'm still learning even to this day and I will and, I'm, and I will still continue to learn about life as I go through it. Cause I mean, I'm only 42, you know, and that's what my life experience has been. Yeah. And I hope that I'm able to experience it more, but I would also encourage, you know, folks to find a community within even that system, which might seem hard, right? Like, well, how are you going to find a community within you know, nothing but guys that have committed certain offenses to land them, yeah. you know, in this system. But you can. Yeah. You can find community. And I think prison education is like one of the best ways to go, I feel. I remember, uh, I don't know if I've told this story on YouTube or what, but uh, I remember, you know, when I was in state jail, on Hutchins state jail, mm -hmm. I was 18 years old. And I was, I was only one of those six months deals I had a stolen car. And I was talking to somebody about when, hey, when we get out, you and me, we go and do this, that, sure. and the other. And he was like, nah, like no disrespect or nothing, but I don't want to have anything to do with anybody in here when I get out. <laughs> and I was like, why? He was like, we, he started talking about people in prison. I was like, bro, you're in here with me right mm -hmm. now. Like, what, what are you talking about? He had this mindset that everybody in prison was untrustworthy. Well... When I went back to prison, I got out for a few months and um, I am still friends today, 20 something years later with people that I was in the day room, mm -hmm. you know, talking about my, my old Sally is in our network. Me and we oh, really? for three years. Well, I didn't know that. And uh, he's on some of these Thursday, nine, Wednesday calls. And it's been 20 years. Um, so I, I do encourage people to do that. Like we think in prison, you can't trust nobody. Everybody's trying to run game on you. And, and there are a lot of people doing that, but there are also genuine folks and education is, mm -hmm. is a good place to find them. Yeah. And I think that's what I found a lot out here too, because the majority of folks that I associate with are people that are driven and motivated and, you know, have access, higher education in prison and outside of it. And, and they're also being of service too, in some way. Yeah, to their communities if it's either inside or out. Oh, that's big too. Yeah, yeah. I think, finding something to keep mm -hmm. keep them actively serving others. Yeah, purpose, purpose. I mean, and I think a lot of the work that I've done to this day is, you know, in the back of my mind, like to right wrongs too. You know, I feel like sometimes I never, I can't ever do enough to do that, but um, I've slowly but surely worked my way to kind of leaving that in the past. And yeah, focusing on the future and and just continue. To, to do this work, whatever that looks like, you know, it's looked very different over the past 11 years. Yeah. You know, from substance use counseling, the policy to now state government managing state funded programs, you know, um, it's crazy. It's you know, cool. It is <laughs> cool, you know, and I give it all to God, you know, like letting them lead the way and, yeah. um, and just enjoying the time, you know, I have with family, you know, my blended family that I have, I never, would have thought that this is what family would look like. But I think that's one thing that I craved when I was inside was one day having a family, 
and I kind of rushed into it, jumped into it, but it's probably been the big, biggest blessing for me. Yeah. With everything that I've said today, I think family is where I really found my purpose. Yeah. And everything else that I do outside of it, it just kind of benefits it. I always want to make sure that it's benefiting positively rather than taking taking me away from my family or hurting them. Yeah. Just finding the balance, right? Finding the balance. That's tough at times, but I always remind myself to make time for them because at the end of the day, they're, they're like, they're, without them, I'm, yeah, it doesn't feel right. Well, I'm glad we finally got to do this interview. Yeah, it's me too, Two brother. years of passing each yeah. other. And I know we'll have many more conversations. Yeah. For sure. All right. Well, thanks, Jose. Yeah, bro. Thank you.